introduce to you our opening keynoter, a man who has personally been involved in changing the world. Uh, I know this topic, which is quite close to my heart, Mr. President, digitization, technology, entrepreneurship, was a core pillar of your role as president of Bulgaria and the reason, one of the reasons we're all here today. So with this, uh, I would uh, have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you uh, the former president of Bulgaria, Rosen Plevneliev. Did I do that well? I was living in Germany eight years ago. And in Germany I had many, many, many names. Uh, for the Deutsche Telekom I was player in the year. Uh, for the authorities in Germany, after a couple of years trying to tell them how my name <laughs> has to be written and spelled, at the end I was playing you without V on the end. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, we're creative, we're open-minded. Most important thing here we have bright people, wonderful people. I'm very proud to talk to you. It's about Europe, it's about Bulgaria, it's about transformation, and it's about policies. About Europe. If you see today a lot of question marks about Europe, uh, but if you set up the right questions, uh, you will find the right answers. And the European Union today generally is asking a lot of questions itself. The European Union is in trouble, it's weakened, it's shaken, and we send not the right messages to the world, but the European Union is a unique project, and nobody should underestimate the strength of a union that is unique in its its core and its ideas, and the ideas for people that come together, for people that think beyond borders, for policies that integrate and they go beyond borders, that idea is just starting to come up and to flourish. So I'm a great believer in the European Union and I see a lot of smart new moves of administration. I do not fear administration. The European Union is not just about 30,000 people in Brussels and a lot of rules. How do we pick up the cucumbers and tomatoes and what is the standard of that? It's not about this. It's about the biggest economy in the world. And after Brexit, it will continue to be the biggest economy in the world. It's about 500 million people who understand very clearly as difference to the American President Trump today who believes he needs to start and strike deals. I don't think policies is linked in any way to making deals. And secondly, uh, the President Trump today uh, is sending a message that he will be making bilateral deals. So he will be making a deal with China, he will be making a deal with Russia. But to tell you something I learned, knowing everybody who is anybody in the global politics, uh, just showed me one problem that could be solved on bilateral. There is no such issue. Terrorism, global crisis, financial crisis, migration, there is no way that any of those problems could be solved just by two nations. So the solutions for the future are multilateral, they're not bilateral. So because of that, and if we see a further winnings of the United States, this will make actually Europe stronger. Europe has to mobilize. Up to now, if we speak a bit about geopolitics, we had the unconditional and very strong guarantee from the United States. We called it the security umbrella of the United States. And having this, the European Union flourished. If now we have a new American president that is going to question that, it's up to the Europeans to come up with solutions. How do they increase the level of security for the citizens? How do they make sure that people here see that the state and the politicians do not just register but solve the crisis? They bring solutions, not just problems on the table. And this is going to happen. And nobody should underestimate that the European Union has been facing many, many, many crises in the past. Just remember that from the Caribbean, from the crisis with the benzene and the, the crisis of wars and the crisis in Yugoslavia, many, 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 many. And we will, and we are mobilizing, and we will, and we are bringing solutions. And um, I'll give you just two examples, and it's about not just solutions, but about a lot of money that will be available for you 
those who want to thrive, those who want to be part of innovations, and to those who want to invest, <coughs> flourish, and develop startup, but also grow in the biggest economy in the world. If you look at the Jean-Claude Juncker plan, the so-called European Development Plan today, it's not just about taking 50 billion euros. It's about bringing private and government money together. It's about changing the mentality of Brussels, but all the other governments in Europe. Because up to now, it was like, here is the cohesion fund, 330 billion euros. Here is the ERDF. Here is the ESF, European Social Fund. Here is the agricultural policies. All together is 1,000 billion euros. Now, this is changing. After 2020, those money is not going to go anymore for highways, railways, and uh, just direct subsidies to the end users. The government are under pressure. The governments are under pressure all over the European Union. And the Jean Claude Juncker is just the first phase in a much bigger plan to create not billions, but thousands of billions in favor of PPPs for projects of the future. So, just the beginning was with the Jean Claude Juncker plan because we have like a multiplier of 15. I don't think he's going to get this, but I don't think this is bad. Because up to now, the multiplier was almost nothing. I mean, we just put 300 billion to European member states and they build directly highways and this and that. This is going to change. We will be trying to multiply those funds by attracting private capital. And guess what today? There is a mountain of private capital available for projects that make sense. There is unbelievable, unlimited possibilities to fund anything that makes sense. And as Professor here today gave an example of Daimler, I think that we're coming back to a very important point today. And this is about, just look at Daimler's example 10 years ago. The boss of Daimler, this is the biggest conglomerate, industrial conglomerate of Europe. They believed if we get billions and we marry billions with more billions by the merger of Daimler with Chrysler, this will create a much more billions. And this was very, very wrong from the beginning. So by marrying Daimler to Chrysler, we have a full disaster actually. So if you just look at what was and where was the market 10 years ago that we had so much cheap and easy money in the period of 2004 to 2008 that everybody was thinking billions would become more billions and everybody was focusing on quantities. Today, it's not an issue anymore. It's not an engine of investments anymore. Today, what matters is not quantities, but qualities. And actually, by Dunder coming back to where they were, they created a new quality that is now having also the best possible balance sheet since many, many, many years and a record number of profits just because they came back to the understanding that they are a symbol not of billions but of quality. And when you speak about quality, quality is everywhere. Quality we could see in a startup with just one or two young people. Quality is all over the world and talent is all over the world. And I'm very proud uh, to share with you the very first steps of what we've done in Bulgaria to give way to quality and to make sure that talent is going to come up and probably the billions will come later. But let us just think about the ideas, let us think about what really makes sense and problems that make, projects that make sense. And then, as the Germans say, and those of them understood very clearly, Money is just a thing, but it's not a goal. It's not the sense of what we do. So, in Bulgaria, with no money at all, we started in 2004 uh, the ICT cluster. It was just about trying to bring just one word with the content. And this word is the recipe for success. And this word was not understood by many other governments all over Europe. And that word is an ecosystem. Governments have been pouring billions, but they did not create an ecosystem. We had a lot of high-tech parks. Hundreds of millions of euros have been investing all over Europe. But they did not attract talent, and it was just heavily poisoned and dependent on government money subsidies. 
Bulgaria decided to go another way, a very shy, with a small amount of money. We decided to work on bringing content and creating an ecosystem. I was very proud of the number of great Bulgarian uh, entrepreneurs in 2004 to be the founder of the ICT cluster. We've done it in the storage. We had no money to pay for the rent. It was not an office space, it was a storage. In here there are some guys, they know it happened in one of the buildings in another business park in the year 2004. But then there was an idea behind it. And there was a lot of positive emotion and um, let's say motivation. That's what we see today. As a result, just two years after, HP came to Bulgaria with 6,500 working places. As a result, a number of big companies started discovering the capabilities of Bulgarian computer programmers, which are definitely the best in the region. As a result, 10 years later, we have 16,000 computer programmers in place. We have 35,000 additional in the outsourcing business, which we're not calling it anymore outsourcing business. We call it the sourcing business. And the global strategy and the global standard in the sourcing business was agreed, established, and uh, as a result of full consensus was done here in Sofia a year ago. In these 10 years, the ecosystem started flourishing because of this bright young minds we have here. Yes, Bulgaria doesn't have such a good reputation. Yes, Bulgaria is not good at marketing. And I'm always very happy with this. But probably also because of this. It was not about money. And it was not about just nice settings and nice Excel sheets. It was about a, a lot of enthusiasm, bottom up, which brought wonderful results. We do have 75,000 new jobs in those three industries in my term as a president for five years. 75,000 young people that stayed may not have left, but anyhow. Let the young people be free, let them fly. Some of them are coming back. 25,000 in the automotive industry. We have 30 new factories of subcomponents in Bulgaria, including that the air conditioning of the Mercedes S Plus is done in Bulgaria. The lenses of all the BMWs is done in Bulgaria. The steering wheels of all the are done in Bulgaria. 35,000 in the outsourcing, in the sourcing industry, and 16,000 computer programmers, and they're all registering to me when I was the president a couple of months ago that they want to double. And here is our problem. The problem is our universities need to be quicker, more efficient, and here is something very important about policies. Yes, we were right by doing the cluster. Yes, we were right by giving state money to wonderful bright Bulgarians who made one of the best accelerators in Europe and the best accelerators in the region with 25 million euros. Yes, the ecosystem, the incubator, the Sofia Tech Park, the technologies, the laboratories is all there. Our universities are slow. They're not so quick enough. We're facing problems with this. But here is the private initiative again. We do have private universities coming up. And here I just want to thank Brian for Gerrits. For example, four guys created a company called Telerik 12 years ago. This was the biggest deal, which was sold to Progressive Software for $265 million. The biggest deal that the cluster was done in Bulgaria, and those guys are now giving. They're giving, they're creating private universities. Thousands of young people are also going there. So, again, an ecosystem. The state, the entrepreneurs, the municipalities. You've seen a number of wonderful mayors who joined us yesterday, and they compete between themselves to have a better transportation and a better uh, universities. We're not there where we would like to be, but we know we're on the right track. And it's not about me, and it's not about the rating of one or another politician, and even it's not about all those forums, we're so proud of being part of them. It's about tens of thousands of young people that have seen the horizon, that they are bringing young ideas, and they are trying to do something. And I'm very proud of this, and I'm very grateful to all of you coming all over the world today to give additional boost to all those bright people all over the region because there is so much talent, there is so much potential, but it depends on everyone.
every single one to unlock its talent <coughs> and depends on every state to unlock the potential and the style of the talent of its nation. Thank you very much. You're back here 10 years from now at Webin, here in Sofia. What are you telling the audience in 10 years? Well, <laughs> in 10 years it is all going to change again. I mean, uh, for 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago there was no smartphone at all. And uh, today, I'm telling you, yesterday I, I spent probably 40 minutes with a wonderful, bright young Bulgarian who works for Google and who is a head of research of quantum computing at Google. Uh, and I was telling him, that, what about 10 years? <laughs> so please tell me, I'm a very curious politician, I want to know. I was asking Bill Gates, I was asking the President Xi Jinping, the President of China, asking him, tell me, there is just two countries in the world that have 2050 strategy. And it is, guess what, China and it is Germany and nobody else. America doesn't have even 2030 strategy. The European Union is working now on 2030 strategy. So, I was asking the President Xi Jinping, tell me what about China 2050? And he said, Mr. President, you're asking the most difficult question, but I cannot tell you about China 2050, I will tell you about China 2049. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, tell me what is going to happen in China 2049. He said, you know what? We lifted them out of poverty, 300 million people. We brought them from poor regions to Shanghai and other big, big cities, and we created a middle class, a vibrant and a strong middle class. So, you know what? In 2049, China will be a flourishing democracy. I said, wow, okay, this is perfect. <laughs> this is wonderful. But they have also an amazing program about. Uh, really beyond the sky. The Germans just have two priorities up to 2035. The Germans are very focused and they are speaking about internet, energy internet. They truly believe that energy is wasted big time and they truly believe that energy should be flexible enough to come to you wherever you need, however you need, as they have your mobile, uh, mobile connection. You will be driving your electric car, you don't need to plug it in, you will be just driving it to recharge automatically, it will be just internet of things, but energy internet. And uh, on the other side, the Germans also, of course, believe in electromobility, and uh, Tesla is going to be facing huge troubles in the future, actually, because uh, they have been enjoying a wonderful market segment of being the pioneers, they've done it great. But now every and all the big players now will be bringing amazing number of new technologies and cars on the table in this segment. Dear friends, in 10 years, I don't want to be, uh, let's say, to, to be the guy who will tell you how the new smartphones they Definitely they will have quantum chips and not anymore those chips we know. Definitely the smartphone 10 years in the future will be uh, linked to your brain. Uh, definitely, uh, we will see an amazing change. Two things I don't want to change at all. And the one is the eyes of people I see in the world me around now. Uh, human, curious, open-minded, and uh, willing to try and explore. Uh, because whatever the computers are going to do for us, whatever the machines and the rise of the machines is inevitable, and the factories will be more efficient, more clean, Machines will be producing everything, they will be customizing everything. You will be having your own shoes, your own glasses, your own um, whatever. In 10 years, uh, the biggest industry of the future, I can predict, probably the biggest will be human health, everything linked to life sciences, because this will be just a giant supermarket you can imagine for health. You will be buying years, you will be buying everything. And uh, people will be having an amazing opportunities to live longer, to be healthier. This will be just creating a dramatic and a huge industry of the future. And another, of course, huge industry of the future will be everything linked to, uh, we call it today ICT, but it's not going to be ICT anymore. Uh, but anyhow, let's continue 
using the same uh, alternative. Whatever the future, the future is bright. The future is uh, of people who will continue to dream, produce, and look beyond the machines, the horizon. But I want really in 10 years here to have a full tent of young people who will then be even more motivated to try, explore, bring up the bar because if you want to jump, if you want to fly, the only possibility to do so is just to raise the bar. Because only those who are jumping are those who can really fly. I think. That create leaders to essential are vision and energy. You clearly have both. Uh, but as I've come to know you the past day, I, I, I recognize you have something that many leaders lack, and that's warmth. Uh, a true sense of sincerity and warmth. You talked a little bit about the EU at the beginning. I certainly cannot speak and would not speak for our current administration in the United States. But I can uh, speak as a citizen. Um, as a child growing up, studying European history over many years, the European project has been inspiring, starting with the European coal and steel community so many years ago, and to have this massive continent, a continent that has had history of conflict as well as, well as progress coming together over these years, and we, we all, the world will be a better place if we make that happen. You also mentioned starting the ICT community here in Bulgaria in a storage, uh, being essentially a storage building. Well, of course, this is consistent uh, to our hearts in the United States, uh, in Silicon Valley, where the myth, of course, is of businesses being started in garages. So the next HP will undoubtedly be somewhere here in Sofia, and in no small part thanks to your efforts. Thank you again, Mr. President.